Uh, I'm Jo Ruxton. I'm the producer of the documentary A Plastic Ocean and founder of uh, Plastic Oceans UK, soon to become Ocean Generation. And I'm Paul Rose. I'm the expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas. I've spent my life leading science expeditions and I'm also the ambassador for the UN Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions. Paul, it takes such a long time to get all your achievements out in one, one sentence. Um, I've always been in awe. Um, but it's a, a pleasure to be talking to you today um, about the issue. Well, it's not a pleasure to be talking about the issue, but it's a pleasure to be talking to you about it. Likewise, Joe. I mean, you know, it's all about communication, isn't it? We've got, we all know about plastic. I can't go to any school system anywhere in the world without finding another uh, beautiful plastic waste project, you know, whether it's in the ocean or in the land or around wildlife mm -hmm. or in humans, you know, everybody's got it. And then as well as the schools, you go to any business, any political meeting, any NGO, any expedition, anywhere, there's a there's a plastic theme and a plastic element, but it's all about how we tell the story. And that's what you're so absolutely brilliant at. We need, we need you and your team to keep telling these stories. <laughs> Working on it, Paul. But yes, it's interesting you should say that about how schools are, because it's 12 years ago that I started to make this film and actually nobody was talking about it much then. And when I wanted to do it, I wanted to, to talk to other green groups and see who we could get in, because this is the kind of problem you can't solve on your own. And although I, I spoke to a lot of them, nobody seemed interested in plastics. And there were a couple doing beach cleanups. But if we, if we keep cleaning beaches, the plastic will keep coming. And although that does a lot to prevent it getting right out into the ocean and to get it the situation where it's getting into the food chain, but we've got to stop it at source. And it's interesting now, going to schools, how different it is from right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, it was like a new story to tell. And they were, you know, eyes were open. They had no idea this was going on. And now, as you say, they can't wait to show you their artwork. There's so much they know. They know that turtles eat plastic bags and mistaking them for jellyfish. There's so much that is going on. And they've been incredible ocean ambassadors, you know, from tiny age. They just, they really get into this. They get it far quicker than the adults and way quicker than any governments that we've uh, finally got to talk about this. So yeah, it's, it's, it's heartening. That side of it is, is, you know, it warms my heart. I think so too. And I think the young ones have helped us as a society get to that point where throwing away plastic visibly in public is seen as a complete disaster. Now, finally, it's become socially unacceptable. I still remember walking behind people in London as a kid and when they un unwrapped their cigarette packets and threw that little plastic foil thing away, it was completely normal. Um, no one squawked, no one even mentioned it, but now it's all of that sort of activity has become very socially unacceptable. And I expect it's the young ones that's really helped us a lot uh, in that regard. I think I often look at the social acceptability level as a way of measuring progress on something. Mm, mm. No, it's it, it's interesting. I, I think that uh, I, I think that we don't give them enough credit for the power that that they have. You know, I, I used to think I, I used to work for WWF when I lived in Hong Kong, and I used to think that it was fantastic that we were doing educational work um, with all of the school the school children. But I also had this feeling in the back of my mind that we we don't have time to wait for these people to grow up and be uh, become policy makers or people that can actually make change. But my goodness, when, I, when I'm out there now with, with the children who are talking about plastic, they are embarrassing their parents and their teachers and their peers into doing the right thing. They are so powerful. And that's become very, very clear as well with the work that's being done on, on climate change with, with Greta and the people that she's managed to you know, turn their attention to such a massive, massive issue. We've still got a long way to go, and, and I'm just wondering what, what could be next. I, I think it's all about the communication, Joe, as I started, because there are some great technical breakthroughs. There are some great social breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. There's finances that are, that, that are working out for us. I think the High Ambition Coalition 
30 by 30 campaign for nature, you know, protect 30% of the planet by 2030. Of, mm. You know, 50 plus countries signed up to this. There's a sense of direction. The, the new Green Deal in the EU, there is a general sense of, of progress and action on all things uh, environmental. And I'm really hoping that, that plastics will contribute to that and also get swept up in this new way forward. I'm, I'm very optimistic about this whole thing, as you well know. Yeah. But we're not going to get it unless we communicate properly. I mean, when I'm on one of our expeditions and every single water sample we take from whichever depth and whichever part of the ocean and however clear and beautiful that blue yeah. water is, we know it's full of plastic. Um, yeah. And we discover, yep, there's nanoparticles in yes. there. What a design. Yes. So for those of us at the front line, it'd be great to know that you at your front line can really ramp up and really change the game. I think I think that, you know, your communication skills are going to be ever more important in these next few years. Well, thank you, Paul. And I, I, I do hope that we uh, will be able to get uh, going with our next film very soon as well. I mean, we, we've had lockdown and funding issues, but uh, we had funding issues with the previous one. I mean, that film took eight years to make. And there were times when I just thought it, it was never going to happen. And, you know, I'd imagine getting it done in 18 months. And uh, that wasn't the case. But at least by the time the film came out, there was an appetite for more information on this. You know, we'd been getting information out to our organisation. And I think that's important. But when I look back on starting it all i was working for the bbc as you know in the natural history unit working mostly on underwater documentaries and we were always showing the oceans as if there wasn't a problem there that you know that that they were clean and that there were loads of fish in there and you know the the what we were actually seeing on location was nothing like that and the time we would spend just waiting to get two minutes worth of footage you know you'd be out there for six weeks and people kind of think you go out and there it is and my yeah. problem with, with that was that if people perceive the oceans to really be like that they'll think it's fine to continue extracting all the goodness from them and throwing everything from effluent to nuclear waste not to mention plastic into them because this this idea that you can deep six anything you know the oceans are huge there's plenty more fish in the sea and that just isn't the case and so to, to make a documentary at that time about something as dull, I'm sorry, uh, as plastic pollution was quite a challenge. And, and certainly the BBC weren't interested because I did pitch the idea um, when, when Blue Planet 2 was, was coming together and it was, there was just no interest. And, and it was a case of people don't want bad news. Well, actually, good news doesn't tend to make the news. So why not? educate people about something that is so important to all of us and you know eventually i mean with, with a lot of help from sir david attenborough and, and people such as yourself paul the message has got out there and and you know the the, the credit that we should have given our audience is long time ago it is there people want to know they want to be educated and then they want to know what they can do about it and you're right about technology there's a lot more solutions that have come come forward now there are solutions in our film which i wouldn't recommend now but the one solution that absolutely addresses this is our own behavioral change it is replacing this single use lifestyle that we have we just don't value anything and the idea of not using plastic for these single-use items but changing it all to cornstarch or some kind of food waste that comes with a whole host of problems and and one of those is the fact that we have starving populations around the planet what are we going to do sorry you can't have access to all this corn we're growing because we've got to continue our convenient lifestyle we've got to get back to valuing things and reusing them and redesigning them and, and just you know, loving them again instead of just assuming, well, that's a bit ropey, I'll chuck it out. It's not like that anymore. We've, we've got to respect what we have and we've got to most of all respect the planet because it's the only one that we can live on. Absolutely fantastic, Joe. And, and, and that's the kind of language that, that we need. And as you say, we, need, we do need the, we need both, don't we? We need to be able to love things. We do need the glorious documentaries that you produce and films that we all see, Sir David Attenborough and others do. You know, we need that glorious stuff to remind us what we're trying to protect. Because, as he says himself, you you need to love it before you can protect it. Absolutely. Um, 
but then in doing so, hopefully we can do that wonderful thing of how we engage with the wildlife. I mean, who can forget, and, and this was all uh, around your earlier time with BBC and the Plastic Oceans film, was, was the, the, the albatrosses mm. on, on Marshall Islands, you know, dead on the beach with their stomachs exposed, full of all the objects that we know and see in our daily throwaway life. As exactly. you say, that was an iconic moment or when we saw, you know, in Blue Planet, you know, the whale with the plastic bucket or yes. who would have thought we'd have seen a front page of National Geographic magazine with a plastic bag, which at first glance looks like a oh, an iceberg. iceberg or the yeah. bird with the bird stuck in a plastic bag. And so the way we communicate all these things is so essential. I can't help but think that it's only a couple of weeks, March the 7th. Um, I think that's the right day, is um, uh, World Wildlife Day. And I just, you know, using these key events through our calendar feels like a smart way to focus on certain things. So for World Wildlife Day, I'm hoping we can all focus on wildlife and the engagement with plastic and, of course, eating plastic, getting caught in the plastic, putting it in the food chain and all the other plastic challenges. That seems like a pretty good initial focus. What do you think? Well, I, I absolutely do, as long as we we get the balance right, because what concerns me about um, a, a lot of the news that we're hearing now, apart from the, the obvious news that's affecting the world, but there is so much happening in nature that shouldn't be happening, and wildlife is, is suffering, and, and ultimately humans as well. And what concerns me is that people will become overwhelmed with the bad news. And what happens when you're overwhelmed is you switch off from it. So we have to tell the stories with hope because there is so much hope. And, and I do think that hard hitting punch in the stomach environmental documentaries have their place, but it's the likes of you and I that will watch them and engage with them. and. And, and unless this, you know, your whole life becomes focused around doing something about it, you switch off. And I confess, I switch off from ocean acidification because it really worries me. And my original film is going to be about that. But I couldn't see a way to bring the film around other than the global work that everybody is now getting engaged with in, you know, in pre preventing the climate change and uh, addressing climate change because that's obviously why this is happening. But for me, when I was making the film, I wanted it to be something that people would just go, what are we doing? And, and get it straight away. And that's why I chose plastic. You know, the, the, the reason that we're in this mess is because since the 50s, plastic has been described as disposable. And yet the, the amazing thing about plastic is that it was designed not to break down. You know, all it will do is break up. And yet we're still using it as if, you can throw it away and we talk about throwing it away and, and that's one, one thing is that there is no away with with plastic so once you get that concept it's easy the other ones take harder work and and there has to be hope throughout it and and the, the film that i want to make now um next is is one that will be full of hope um you know whilst we still have hope this is our time that we can turn things around and, and we can do it and and I just don't want to overshadow and overwhelm people with too much bad news when there is still so much hope out there. It's fantastic. I'm so pleased you gave us a hint as to the style <laughs> of the next film because that that's good for all of us. We know we know what to expect. I'm also especially pleased you mentioned about the 1950s. I mean, there's that amazing graph that always springs to mind when I have these conversations about plastic. I mean, I was born in 1951, and the graph goes from 1950 to today. 360 yes. million tons or something of plastic, out of which we've recycled 9%. I know, <laughs> it's wrong, isn't it? Yes. It, it's, it's, um, it's interesting, though, because when, when you were talking about the albatross, um, I've got a jar of albatross stomach contents in, in my kitchen cupboard, like you do. Um, and in that particular one, um, there are four of those uh, single-use cigarette lighters. By single-use, I mean, once they run out, you can't refill them. That to me is the weirdest thing that we we ever started doing. And don't get me wrong, I've lit many a barbecue with those. Um, you know, you, and this plastic lighter runs out, and then you can't refill it, so you throw it away. And I'll never forget when when I just got the trailer for a plastic ocean, and I, I had it on my desktop, and somebody came around who was who was dealing with the plumbing in the kitchen, 
and he, he chats, you know, what are you doing? And, and I said, oh, I've just got this and I'm making this film. And I had the jar of albatross stomach contents on the table, again, like you do, showed him the film. And I said, and all of these uh, were found in albatross stomach chicks and there's these lighters in them. And, and he goes, he says, I, I can't believe that. Do you know the time, and he was a smoker. He said, the times I've walked along the beach at Western Supermare when I'm having a cigarette, lighter runs out and I just see how far I can throw it into the ocean because it's disposable and it was that mindset that we've had that you can keep throwing this away that absolutely changed that day with him but that is starting to dawn on so many people now because of the way people got talking about it you know the the, the film was one catalyst the blue planet 2 was another catalyst the work was being done in schools it is all the message getting out there and that's what we need to keep doing we we need to put the ocean back on the map. You know, it's the last place we consider. And um, I've got uh, a little film that's going to be on our um, Ocean Generation website, uh, which just came through yesterday. And one of the things it talks about in that little film is how um, the ocean provides more than half the oxygen we breathe. And that's still not taught in schools. And I showed it to my little granddaughter, who's seven, and she looks at me and she goes, but none of the oxygen comes from the trees. And I thought, goodness, it's still being taught that way. Yes, it does come from the trees. Don't get me wrong. Forests do a brilliant job, but the ocean does far more. And that needs to be part of our growing up. We need to understand it. It's our life support system. And um, yeah, that's that's what the work's going to be looking at going forward. We'll put it back on the map. People will fall in love with it. And, you know, as, as Jacques Cousteau said, you protect what you love. And, and uh, we need to protect the ocean and we need to love it. Well, it couldn't be a better timing for the new new film. I know it's not simple. You don't just press a button and produce a glorious film. I wish. <laughs> but, yeah. but if we were to run alongside your work, what are we going to see next with the with the film? You know, what's next in planning it, and when will it be on our screens? Well, um, we are doing a lot of research at the moment, getting the stories into a place where we can see how the storyline goes. It's it's very difficult because you have the main storyline and then you've got to think of all the side ones and then you've got to link them together. Um, then we need to get the funding in place. And uh, there, there's certainly more interest this time. I think because A Plastic Ocean um, did circulate pretty well, I think people realize that, you know, there might be, there might be something in this one. Um, we've done our teaser film and um, so we're putting it out there now. And uh, hopefully, once it's funded, we will find a way to not spend too much time in quarantine hotels and get out there and do the filming that we need to do. So um, I, I can't wait. Fantastic. And, and neither can I, Joe. And, and I think it's good news. So for those of you that are watching who maybe are billionaires or maybe <laughs> running businesses that have done extraordinarily well during COVID. We all know those stories. A lot of people are bumping on the bottom, of course, but there are those people out there, and I know you're watching, who just by chance have done really well during these extraordinary times. So if you're one of those, or if you have a passion for making this happen, contact Joe, because this is your opportunity to get your name alongside Joe's making this great film. So thanks very much, Joe, and thanks for all the potential future funders. Thanks for the Geneva oh. Network to help and put this together as well. I'll add my thanks to that. Yes, if, if there's somebody who wants to give something back to the planet, um, we, we will we will absolutely do it credit. Well, I hope we will. We did before. So um, thank you, Paul, for, for mentioning that. <laughs> thanks a lot, Joe, and, and thanks for Geneva Environment Network and everybody yes. behind the scenes to make these things happen. Yeah, my thanks too. And Paul, lovely talking to you as ever. See you. Take care.